All right, everyone, welcome to Textbook Ventures Live AMA, a VC perspective into InsureTech. And we're excited to have you here with us tonight. My name is Erica. I'm currently the head of IT here at Textbook, and I'll be tonight's moderator. Before we begin, just a few digital housekeeping rules. Please turn off your audio and video. And if you have any questions throughout our conversation, feel free to com feel free to comment it into our chat so we can visit this during Q and A. If this is your first time hearing us, Textbook Ventures is a student-run organization focusing on introducing students to the world of startups and entrepreneurship. With us today is Mike, a general partner at IAG Phi Mark Ventures, whose portfolio includes the everyday task marketplace Airtasker and business insight platform Hyperana. So we'll be focusing on Mike's past experience and how it's lent itself to his current role and IAG's role in InsureTech and venture capital before spending the last 20 minutes on Q&A. With that, I'll hand it to Mike so he can introduce himself and share you his journey on how he found himself at Feinmark Ventures. Mark, Mike? Sure. Um, so I'll give yeah, a quick intro, but you know, thank you for that um, warm welcome. So um, I guess when I, if I go right back to the beginning, I started um, coming out of Sydney University with a commerce liberal studies degree went into investment banking at UBS uh, for about two years. Um, so started there in 2007, came out of that, um, wanted to start my own business. So went on the founder journey and teamed up with a guy that I actually went to uh, college with when I was at university. And uh, he was my co-founder. I was, um, and together we built a business called Around You, which at the time was a, a hyper-local business directory. Um, so the sort of split in the team there was I was sort of driving uh, strategy and sales and business development. He was taking on the role of CTO, um, managing the design team and the engineering team and the developers. Um, and that became a pretty good business. We grew that to have 50 odd people in Sydney and we had a team in the Philippines um, as well. We did that for five years went through the full journey of ups and downs. We ended up exiting through a merger uh, with another VC backed company in Australia called Nabo, which was backed by reInventure, um, Seven West Media and also Fairfax. Uh, and then last year, uh, Nabo ended up getting acquired by a US company called Nextdoor, which is a, um, a unicorn over in the US that's backed by some prominent VCs over there. So when I came out of Around You, um, I wanted to combine my earlier experience in finance with uh, what I had been doing for the five years after that in uh, entrepreneurship and venture capital made sense to, I mean, that was the logical sort of pathway to go down to combine those two things. So I was lucky that at the time, it was when venture capital in Australia was starting to you know, go through a renaissance period almost where it was finding its feet again after many years of um, really being non-existent. So around 2014, 2015 was when things started to really kickstart again in the venture space in Australia. So there's new funds popping up. Um, there were corporates like IAG and Westpac and ANZ and a whole bunch of others that were wanting to start funds. So I was lucky that I was in the right place at the right time. And I got introduced to the people at IAG who coincidentally were considering and wanting to set up a fund at that time so that's how I landed um, at IAG um, and I've been there for the last five years um, managing the Firemark Ventures Fund. All right awesome so regarding Firemark Ventures what types of startups and teams do you invest in and at what stage? Yep so uh, we're pretty broad in our investment thesis, so it's a lot broader than what people think, and it's not necessarily uh, traditional insure tech as how most people uh, might perceive an insure tech to be. So what I mean by that is, is that we're not necessarily interested in uh, new insurance businesses or new insurance startups, of which you know there's, there's more popping up. Um, so in America, for example, there's one called Lemonade, which gets a lot of PR and press. It's Basically, it's like a neo insurer, kind of like how we have neo banks. Um, there's the same thing happening with insurance. We're a little bit less interested in them, and we're more interested in 
uh, the technologies that we think are important to the future of our business. So technologies that might be doing smart things with data or analytics or computer vision um, or data privacy, for example. Um, technologies where we can uh, invest in order to get ahead of the curve in terms of bringing them into IAG, understanding how they work, adopting them, um, trying to get a competitive advantage by being the first ones in the Australian market to use these technologies. Uh, so there's that sort of focus, but then also we'll invest into adjacent business models where we think there's an opportunity to leverage our brand in ways that go beyond insurance. So IAG owns some really iconic brands like the NRMA, for example, um, and CGU is our uh, SME business brand, uh, business insurance. Uh, so if there's opportunities where we can leverage those brands in our customer reach beyond just insurance, then we'll consider that as well. So Airtasker, um, which you mentioned in the intro, uh, is one of our investments, and that sort of fits in that category. It's you know it's not insure tech. It's not necessarily an advanced technology play, but it's an adjacent business model um, where we offer we do offer insurance through the Airtasker platform, but it's really helped us to. Um, understand the sharing economy and the gig economy in new ways. And we're putting our brand behind that as well to support them. So that's sort of what we invest in, in terms of stage, we like uh, to invest at series A funding rounds and above. And the reason for that is, um, you, you know, we try to avoid the really early stage stuff like seed rounds or pre-seed. And the reason for that is, um, we just find that companies when they're at the series A funding stage, uh, they're a little bit more uh, advanced or developed in terms of being ready to engage with us as a corporate because there's you know challenges that come with being a corporate you can be a bit slow and uh, you know we have our processes and things like that so companies that are just a little bit further along their growth journey tend to be better placed to engage with us and uh, and work with us okay cool and insurance is often considered a dinosauric industry that hasn't really changed over the years. And as you're at the forefront of innovation in this space, what aspects of InsureTech are really emerging and what are you seeing as the most uptake? Yep, so yeah, insurance does, I mean, it is an old industry. Um, you, you know, sort of, I guess as a product, like the concept of insurance has been around for several hundred years and uh, some of the insurance companies have been around for that long as well. So Lloyd's of London, for example, I think has been around for 500 years or something like that, which is amazing really. But the, the way that the businesses operate, um, you know, has fundamentally changed and, and in, you know, despite an insurance company sounding boring, um, the technologies that are important to insurers are definitely, you know, fast move, moving. And it's all the things that we're seeing emerge now around data and, and analytics and machine learning. Because ultimately an insurance business, um, it's really, it's a data business effectively. It's about how well can you um, identify and understand risk and how can you price that risk appropriately so that you can both sell it to a customer in terms of an insurance product, but then um, you know not sell it so poorly that you lose money on it um, as well when claims are made. So the data that IAG needs to ingest and interpret and try and understand, particularly around getting a competitive edge. Um, so how can we develop better risk models and uh, a better understanding of who our customers are? That's really, really important to us, which is why um, what we're doing in ventures when we're engaging with startups, I mean, there's so many startups now that are emerging in this space around big data and applying smart uh, models on top of big data to really get insights into it. So basically, how can we ingest as much data as we possibly can around the assets that we insure uh, our customers, so the people, um, and then once we have all that data, how can we um, put it into a single framework so we can match it all together and see what the correlations are? And then how can we have really smart analytics to actually interpret the data and create good insurance products coming out the other end? So that's why we're heavily focused on those themes. And it's why the ventures space um, for insure tech or insurance is actually you know, quite an interesting space because there's just so much happening right now around the world in terms of these technologies being developed. Cool. 
So how is IAG trying to capitalize on these white spaces or opportunity gaps in the market? So for us, it's uh, mainly just trying to get ahead of the curve because there is so much going on. Um, and the challenge with any big company is that, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of different teams. Everyone has their own budget in that team. Um, so it can be challenging to, um, you know, to, stay up to date with what's going on in the market in terms of the latest technologies and what we should be focusing on. So what we're trying to do in uh, ventures to create opportunity basically is, you know, we're like the, the entry point for startups into IAG. Um, and it's our role to try and identify what these trends are, who are the best emerging companies that are you know, building really interesting products in these spaces. And then how can we, through our investment fund, uh, give them the capital they need to keep growing and developing the product, but then bring them into IAG with a view to create, hopefully, what is a competitive advantage for IAG. So an example of that, um, we recently invested in a US-based company called Arturo, which uh, is a computer vision company. And what these guys do is they ingest aerial image data. So it can be images from satellites, for example, um, but more commonly, it's from Nearmap, which is a company that flies around airplanes and they basically take high resolution uh, photos of the built environment. So, you know, households, buildings, whatever. And uh, Nearmap does this for all of Australia, it does it for pretty much all of the United States as well. Um, or certainly with satellites, for example, you can do it with the whole world. So, anyway, this company, Arturo, what's really unique about them is that. Uh, they'll ingest all that data en masse. So you think, you know, every single household in Australia, for example, high resolution images of the outside of the house, and they're taken from an angle as well. So it's an oblique image, which means it's not just the roof you're seeing, but you're seeing, you know, the front of the house and you're seeing the back and the sides and the swimming pool, and whatever else. But then what Arturo does is through its computer vision model is it identifies all the attributes in those images en masse. So now we know, for example, here's every household in Australia. This is what every household looks like. This is what every roof is made out of. Uh, this is the height of every house. This is how many swimming pools there are, how many carports, how many trees there are around the fence. And once we have all that data, that's, um, I guess, an example of, you know, how we can use that data then to understand risk. So for example, um, you know, if you have a bunch of, and really leafy trees hanging over your roof, then we know that's a risk with regards to storms and with regards to fire, and then it changes our pricing and our modeling and flows through to the experience we give to customers. So nothing like Arturo has existed before in the market. Um, you know, we're, we've invested in Arturo to bring them to Australia. So the advantage for us is um, we're able to offer a better customer experience through examples like that because we're able to offer better pricing faster quoting process we have better data um, and it's a big competitive advantage for us as iag compared to our peers in terms of being able to adopt that technology so we really want to just replicate investments like that that can create that um, advantage for us yeah that's super yes. interesting so more specifically in terms of your portfolio how is your ventures team helping IAG disrupt or accelerate insurance capabilities besides um, Alturo? Um, so every investment we do, we'll try to create a win-win with the portfolio company in terms of a relationship that goes beyond just the capital. So, you know, the funny thing, I guess, in venture investing is, is that now there's a lot of money floating around, not so much in the last month or two, because everyone's a little bit scared with COVID. Um, although it hasn't had a massive impact on, um, on us, um, or just the capital available in general. But, um, I guess the point is, is that, you know, there's, there's money floating around. So us as a strategic investor, we need to be really clear on how we can work together beyond just capital, because if the only thing we have to offer these startups is money, or they can get money, like a good startup can get money from, you know, other financial VC investors, as opposed to a corporate strategic investor. So we try to identify what we think is a win-win opportunity that's going to add value to us at IAG, but also add value to the startup. And when we go through the investment process, we're trying to outline what that is. 
So for us at IAG, it's typically, um, you know, it could be the Arturo example, which is being first to market in Australia and bringing that technology in. But also, in a, we're working with Arturo to help train their model um, in Australia because Australian households are different to American households. So um, they kind of need us to help train their model to make it work in Australia as much as we want to be the first ones to bring it here. But every investment ends up being, I guess, similar in its approach in that we're trying to do something beyond just being a passive shareholder. So it might be um, a data agreement, uh, which we have in place with Airtask as well, for example. So we do have a data agreement that's helping us to understand a whole bunch of these odd jobs that get done around the house that we just never had insight into. And given the fact that we're the largest um, home insurance company in Australia, it's important for us to understand um, you know, what these jobs are and how they're priced and how they work and what the implications of that are. So it could be a data deal. It could be us trying to be first to market with the product. It could be, um, uh, it could be just a distribution opportunity where we can cross sell products between each other. It's sort of a whole range of um, options, I suppose. But the general approach is that it needs to be win-win. So we need to benefit from something and hopefully we offer something back to startups beyond capital as well. Cool. And are there any companies that you have your eye on now, um, that you have your eyes on now, like any exciting startups or anything like that? Yep, um, we do. And we're actually super busy right now, um, which is sort of funny because, uh, you know, everyone's working from home and all of that, but we've got a lot on our plate. Um, so I won't necessarily say the exact name of these companies that we're engaging with right now, just because it's a bit... Uh, you know, premature in the process because uh, we haven't announced it, but I can definitely talk you through the spaces that we're, we're currently exploring and you might be able to figure out what the company is anyway just from hearing that. But um, so, for example, one of the companies we're looking at is in the space tech uh, space, to use that word for us, um, or the space tech area. So there's a company that flies or launches rather um, these micro satellites into low earth orbit for the purpose of um, helping to offer low bandwidth and low energy use IoT solutions, which is a big problem around the world. Um, like of course, most of us live in metropolitan cities and we have broadband and all of that and that's fine. But the majority of the world has no connectivity and existing solutions that provide connectivity uh, will drain a battery and of course, usually if you don't have internet connectivity you're probably in the middle of nowhere which also probably means you don't have a power supply and you can't you know changing batteries frequently from lots of sensors is not practical so we're talking through this particular company at the moment because what they're doing is um is really groundbreaking in this particular space in terms of being able to have sensors for example on a farm that can um read water levels of a you know, a rain storage tank, or it could be a creek and just understanding the water levels of a creek, which is important for us from a flood perspective. Um, or even detecting fires or bushfires early by having um, these really simple sensors just, you know, in the middle of nowhere, but where fires are typically um, going to emerge. Um, so for us, it's important to try and see if we can support that technology and, and get it out there. Um, and we think over the long term, it'll have a fundamental impact on our business because if the thesis of this company proves to be true, which is that uh, inevitably the world's gonna be connected up by these low cost sensors that can just transmit data continuously for 15 years on a single battery. Um, they sort of present that as the future of the world and if that future of the world comes true, then for us it's really, really important from a data perspective and from understanding what's going on in the world. So there's that, and then there's another company, again, this is a US-based company, this other one that's in the data governance space. So obviously what's going on at the moment with all companies and startups and everyone is a lot of concern around data privacy, how data is managed, how it's handled and stored and you know, secured. Uh, and it's a real big challenge. So you know everything I've told you so far about our business being interested in data and how we can try and collect as much data as we possibly can it comes with a lot of responsibility to make sure we use that data appropriately and that um, you know it's anonymized when it should be anonymized and that we're doing the right thing and that it's audited. So there's a company in the US that 
is doing some really amazing work in the data governance space to make that easy uh, and to try and automate a lot of that and to uh, try and have really clear audit trails around how internally we're accessing using data so that basically we can hold ourselves accountable in knowing that we're doing the right thing um, with all the data that we're managing. Yeah, data privacy is definitely a growing importance. So let's lean into um, what you were saying a bit more. Besides the tech component, what are some other aspects that make this company investable? We have a lot of students in the audience who are interested in working in either VC or aspire to become founders one day. So it's important for us to be able to distill what separates the good companies from the great. Yeah, um, so a few things. Um, so I guess like the first thing, my advice for you know, your audience that might be thinking about wanting to do something entrepreneurial or getting into investing themselves. Um, so if you're gonna do something entrepreneurial, for example, um, you know, we try to look at the background of the founder and whether we think that their background has logically led them to be solving the problem that they're solving for. Um, and I, like this is a, it, you know, it sounds obvious, but uh, like the best founder will have just a deep intrinsic understanding of the problem they're solving. So for example, um, one of the first investments we did was into a cybersecurity company called UpGuard. And the two founders of that, you know, they'd had 15 years experience each um, working in large enterprises um, in cybersecurity teams, basically managing these different DevOps issues that would arise and the risks that would come out of that process. And they had recognized this as a problem that they were seeing at multiple organizations they had worked for and they weren't happy with any of the solutions that were being offered to them when they were in their corporate jobs. So they took the plunge and built what they thought was the perfect solution to that problem that they really understood and recognized. So, and that sort of sounds really obvious, but it still, you know, it's not about, I think the mistakes sometimes people make is trying to come up with like a brilliant idea. You know, they'll try and, and sometimes corporates do this as well. You know, you'll have these like idea challenges almost. It's like, let's try and come up with a bright idea or a brilliant idea. It's usually a bit less about that. And it's more about just, you know, if you're thinking about trying to uh, become a founder, reflect upon yourself first and, you know, what is your understanding of the world and what are the, th challenges that you've faced or the problems that you've seen or or what are you passionate about and then how can you uh logically then extend that into a product offering or a business try to do that as opposed to try and think of like a bright idea if that makes sense um and if you don't come up with a good answer um then you might just not have enough experience yet that's the other thing sometimes you just got to experience more of the world in order to come up with that so that would be the first thing it's definitely the first thing we look for, which is who are the founders and how do they really understand what they're doing and are they the right people um, to be solving for the problem that they're trying to solve for. And then um, the other bit of advice I would give is, um, you know, make sure you surround yourself with good people as well. And this doesn't just mean, uh, you know, your founding team, but it also means your mentors and the people that you trust. Um, so a lot of the time, I think the mistake that, uh, young founders make, or a lot of people just in general is, you know, they think they've got an idea for a business they want to start and then they don't want to tell anyone about it because they think someone's going to steal their idea. So they try and just keep it to themselves, but then they don't get much done and they don't, you know, it's just your one man band and nobody knows you. So if, if you're an investor or anybody else, no one's going to give you much attention. The reality is that you know, starting a business is really hard and no one's probably going to steal your idea, no matter how good you think it is. So your best thing to do is to try and build a network around yourself of people that you trust. So other people that might already be successful, other entrepreneurs that have proven themselves, other investors, um, other peers that you think are smart and can, uh, you know, have uh, complementary skills to what you have. You want to tell really as many people as you can tell and surround yourself with as many smart people who can help give you advice because when it comes time to you know get that business off the ground certainly from an investment perspective like we look at who else is around the business like who's on the advisory board 
if you have a board of directors, like who is that board of directors? Are they actually credible? Are they good people? Um, who is the founding team and um, what are their backgrounds and how well do the founders know each other? So, so definitely that. Um, and then the other thing is like that we look for is just real demonstration of, uh, you know, of getting stuff done. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean like, obviously we recognize that every startup goes on a journey. You know, you start with nothing and we tend to invest at the series A stage. So you've usually got a fair bit done by then, but even earlier than that, I mean, even if you're presenting your idea as a pre-seed opportunity, it's still trying to look at like what momentum has been created. And I think most people don't, um, you know, they sort of, they just don't get it that you can, you don't have to wait for things to be handed to you. So you certainly don't have to wait for, a lot of people think, oh, I, I can't do this until I get half a million dollars in pre-seed funding. You know, it's like, I've got a brilliant idea and maybe I'll put together a pitch deck that'll explain my brilliant idea, but I can't do anything else until I convince somebody to give me a whole bunch of money. And that's rarely the case. So usually you can actually do a lot in terms of getting, um, you know, acknowledgement from potential customers or getting a wait list of potential customers or getting a really low fidelity prototype of whatever it is that you're building. Um, you know, as an investor, like looking at what a founder can do, if they can do it a lot with a little, then that's a really, really good sign. If it's, you know, just a business plan or a pitch deck put together and it's like, I've got a brilliant idea and I want some money, you know, that's almost never going to work. So yeah, that, I guess the, if you're a young fan, I think those are probably the three main things that we would probably focus on first in terms of what we would look at or be impressed by. In this environment, has COVID-19 forced you to reprioritize your investments in any way? And what are some strategies or changes your portfolio companies have been executing in response? So it hasn't changed our strategy. Um, because like we're backed by IOG and so we're a bit of a different structure from any other typical financial venture funds, which need to raise money themselves. So we're not, you know, a venture fund spends a lot of their time raising money for their own fund, uh, which is harder in this environment right now so they so a lot of them probably have uh you know changed their approach a little bit because they want to preserve their existing funds a little bit longer uh they want to make sure they've got capital sitting aside to support their existing portfolio companies and they don't know how long it's going to take them to raise their next fund but we're a little bit different um you know we've already got more funding committed from iag um so we're not out there spending time fundraising which means not much has really changed for us we're just still doing the same thing we were doing supporting our portfolio companies with new investments in terms of our portfolio companies though the general advice that we're just giving them is just to uh you know pause for a minute and get back to basics a little bit or just do a sense check that the fundamentals of your business still make sense so get back to thinking about what your unit economics are um, sense checking them in this environment, like do those unit economics still hold up and do they make sense? Um, and also if you had to go a longer period of time without fundraising, um, does your business still make sense and do the unit economics supporting the business still make sense if you had to extend your timeline by another six months, for example, without fresh capital? So we're just trying to encourage that, um, which is not necessarily a radical change, but you know, in times when uh, there's more money flowing around and there's investors, you know, approaching good startups wanting to invest. Um, it's a bit more of a bias, I think, for startup founders to want to just shoot for the stars a little bit more aggressively. And sometimes when that happens, those really basic things start to get out of whack. Like the unit economics start to not make sense. It's like, oh, we're going to pursue growth at all costs because we've got lots of capital. Um, but in this environment, it's just a, it's an opportunity to, you know, pause that a little bit and just go back to basics. All right, cool. So we have tons of students in our community interested in the investor path. What are some key things that we can do well in uni to help us break into VC? Sure. Um, so the thing I've observed is that there's no one clear pathway into venture capital, um, which I guess is 
you know, both a good thing, but also a confusing thing. So I guess it's a good thing because it kind of means, you know, any, like a lot of different people with different backgrounds can end up in there. Um, so the opportunity is probably never closed off, but it's a confusing thing because everyone wants to try and, you know, identify a pathway to get in. that makes sense. Right. So it's a bit different from some other career paths where it's more obvious how to do that. Um, I think the, so I guess there's two ways. Like the environment now in Australia, there's a lot more funds um, around than there ever has been before, uh, which is good. And a lot, well, a number of those funds are doing quite well, um, which is fantastic to see. And because they're doing well, they're starting to build out you know, a hierarchy within their team. You know, so they might've started with two uh, partners, but now they've got partners and principals and associates and analysts and interns and everything else. Um, so if you're at university or you're coming out of university, it's now possible to get an internship at a venture fund, or a graduate role at a venture fund, for example, whereas five years ago, that was never, that would, like just didn't exist, never would have happened. So I guess, so if you're, looking for an, you know, to start um, like your career at the very beginning in VC, the best way to do it, I would recommend. Um, and, and I say this to a lot of people is it's like a good idea just to keep your own shadow portfolio of investments that you think are good. And I give this advice because um, everyone wants to understand what your thinking is. So it's one thing to come out of university and to have good grades and, you know, maybe you've done some work experience or whatever, but a lot of people, you know, come out of university with good grades and, um, and there's only such a small VC community to begin with anyway. And good grades is not necessarily, uh, even the best predictor of success in venture capital anyway. So it's more about trying to understand your thinking. So if you can create a shadow portfolio and I call it a shadow portfolio, basically what I mean is, is, you know, keep your finger on the pulse with regards to what's going on in the market. So just read the news effectively, you know, who's raising money, who's investing in who, and you can read some of these articles and you can try and create your own thought process or thesis around whether this is a good company or, you know, would you have put your money in? Yes or no. And I think if you can showcase that, to, you know, if you're applying for a graduate role, for example, at a venture fund, if one exists, or even an associate role, and they're going to ask you, they're going to be like, well, what companies do you like? Or, um, you know, what, why would you invest in this company and not this other company? If you can answer that clearly, and especially if you can show a track record, and, you know, if you had it on a blog or a medium uh, post or whatever, or on Twitter, wherever it is, and you're like, oh, I just read that Andreessen Horowitz invested into this company, you know, at a hundred million dollar valuation, the company hasn't even launched yet. Well, that sounds interesting. Like, here's my thoughts around that, then that is the thing that'll probably get you a leg in to get people's attention because it shows that you actually understand what's going on, you're following the news, you're actually interested in it, and you can think about things, which is the most important thing. Okay, cool. Um, do you have any particular experience that you've had in the past that has helped you make informed decision on investments today? So it's definitely, it's the, uh, it's the culmination of all of my experiences, I think. Um, like it's been good having gone from being a founder to then investing, definitely. Um, but then just the process over the last five years, having you know assessed many hundreds, probably over a thousand businesses and dissecting their business model to try and understand what works and what doesn't work. And then being an, an investor in businesses and seeing what actually does work and doesn't work. Um, like developing that pattern recognition over time has definitely been helpful. So I don't think there's any necessarily like, you know, one um, pivotal event or moment or experience or anything like that. It's more that I think I've been fortunate to, I've always sort of put myself into unknown situations, you know, situations where I probably felt a bit out of my depth. And then you come out of there and you learn a whole lot. And then when I look back in hindsight, it's not necessarily any one of those particular things, but looking through all of those experiences, I think has just helped me to have better pattern recognition with regards to looking at a business model now 
we're looking at an investment opportunity and having a better sense of whether it might work or not work. All right, great. So that's it from me. So now we'll open up to the audience for Q&A. And so if you have any questions, please comment them in the Zoom chat. We have our first question here. Is it true that insurance industry is extremely price sensitive and that incumbent insurers struggle to create customer loyalty? And is this something IAG and Biomark Ventures is actively tackling and how so? So it's actually, it depends um, who the insurer is funnily enough. So with IAG, believe it or not, the experience is actually somewhat the opposite. So customers are far less price sensitive than, um, than what you might think. And customer loyalty is actually far higher um, than what you might think, which is a bit counterintuitive and not all brands are the same. So I think with IAG, so IAG is not the cheapest insurance company in the market, never has been, probably never will be. Um, our prices are more uh, expensive than pretty much everyone else in the market. Uh, yet we do still have extremely strong customer loyalty and the strongest insurance brands um, in Australia. So, um, yeah, which is, I guess, the opposite of that, that statement. Um, we do, there is a, I mean, it is shifting a little bit. Like our IAG's customer base is, you know, excused the older generation. Um, and those customers that have been with IAG for 10 years, 20 years, some of them you know, 50 years or longer, um, are incredibly loyal and they, they will probably never switch. Where IAG has a real challenge at the moment is around um, more of a younger generation. So people that are coming out of you know, school, university, and they're thinking about insurance for the first time, or in your 20s or your 30s and you're gonna buy a house, so you need home insurance, that's, where it's more of a, um, an issue for IAG at the moment, which is, uh, you know, if you're, say you're you know, 21 or something and you're looking to buy insurance for your new car, you probably don't care about some fuddy-duddy brand called NRMA because you haven't, you, know, you haven't necessarily had a, a bad claims experience yet or you haven't had a good claims, you probably haven't crashed your car, so you, you haven't really had any experience um, engaging with an insurance company when you actually need them. Um, so our main challenge is how do you convince like younger people, and people that are thinking about insurance for the first time, that you should pay more money to go with a brand like NRMA um, because we promise that you'll have a better experience if things go wrong and we'll look after you better and all of the rest of it. And that's like, that's a hard sell. Um, Right, because if you have nothing, if you've never crashed your car, or you've never had a fire in your house, or your house has never been flooded and destroyed, so then you you, know, you don't know what that experience is like. So you're like, well, what do I compare it to? Like, what is a good claims experience, or what is a bad claims experience? I have no idea what that means. So you tend to go for a more budget insurance company. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And how do you see the insurance industry evolving in the next ten years? Um, it's funny, like, so it's definitely an arms race with regards to adopting technology. That's definitely happening. All those reasons I've mentioned prior around data and you know, having smart models and things like that. So that's going on. Um, like, so a few years ago, I thought that, um, you know, incumbent insurers were highly at risk of disruption from you know, faster moving neo insurers like the lemonades of the world in the United States that I mentioned at the beginning of um, this Zoom call. And I sort of thought that because I, like, I came, I had a basic thought process, which was, you know, you can't be big and slow and the most expensive and think that you're always gonna win. But then on the other hand, more recently, particularly after seeing you know, some of the bushfire events and some of the things that have gone wrong and the response from different insurers, um, you know, it's definitely convinced me of the need for quality and you do pay for quality and you get what you get. So I don't know, so now I'm a little bit conflicted. So whereas a few years ago, I thought that there'd be 
you know, far more disruption coming from startups that would eat away at our brand and start to eat away at our market share at a rapid rate. Um, I'm now starting to shift my thinking on that a little bit and thinking that there could actually end up being more of a, a, you know, a flight to safety kind of approach where I think people start to recognize that um, the role of insurance and, and some of the other big institutions in Australia as well, it can be quite, uh, you know, it's really important and you need it when it matters most. And if the incumbents like IAG, um, if we can adopt the right technologies to hopefully improve our efficiency and hopefully we can move fast and keep doing everything we promised to do, um, I think we could still be in a really strong position even into the future. And how has your founder experience given you an edge when looking at companies slash teams to invest in? So I think the, like it helps because it gives you some empathy with the founding team. Um, and it also means like, I think a mistake that uh, some investors can make uh, typically the ones that might just come from, you know, purely like a banking background, for example. So there's a, you know, quite a few investors who might just, they've had really good finance experience and maybe they've done really well on that and now they want to do something a little bit more interesting so they want to invest in startups but sometimes you can get too bogged down in just the numbers alone and you know a financial model can be constructed to really tell any story that you want it to tell and some people focus very much on purely what that financial model is telling them uh, without sort of seeing through it to the next level and being like, well, actually what's going on behind the business? Like you know, how's the team really going to work and how is this founder really going to understand like how to grow this business and are customers really going to resonate with this product when it starts to scale? And so all of those things are more nuanced and I think being a founder, having gone through that myself helps to give me a different perspective on that or definitely at least helps me to understand the journey that these founders are going to go through and helps create that empathy. Do you think that any of the skills you developed during your time as an investment banker helped you in your time as a founder or at Firemark Ventures? Yep, so I definitely do. Um, like I think it's good for any of your audience that's listening. Um, you know, sometimes you get a really good sort of base grounding of skills by coming out of university and going into um, a hard early career path like investment banking or management consulting um, or certain technology fields as well because it just gives you a good uh, grounding of the skills that you need and I think that's important sometimes you can be you know your ambition might be you know to skip that but if you skip that you don't know what you don't know so it has def it definitely helped me just to understand what a big business looks like how it works and what skills are just important to basically get by in basic sort of business life. Do you have any thoughts on Tesla's insurance business model as they have seen to have sort of perfected the data collection on in the car insurance industry? So yeah, that is, and I guess to answer the question around like where the insurance industry might go in 10 years, um, like that whole area of autonomous cars and the Teslas of the world, that's an, like an existential threat to auto insurance, certainly is. Um, the big risk to us in that regard is that Tesla ends up, as an example, just having a, and I think, I'm not sure if they're, where the exact current status of their insurance offering so has changed a bit, but they are likely to either self-insure or to have a global um, insurance offering from a global insurer like Allianz, for example, where they will just negotiate a global policy and the car will be insured through that policy um, and it will understand the uh, risks with autonomous driving and everything else. And there just might be no need to engage with um, NRMA. Although there are still... Um, you know, the, 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 the risk that comes from CTP insurance versus um, what you also get with comprehensive car insurance. So things like hailstorms, for example, like hailstorms are the number one sort of 
uh, cost associated with insurance, with auto insurance. So that's still going to happen, even irrespective of autonomous cars or not. So it's really a question of like, what, where does IAG fit into that puzzle? Like, do we end up having specific contracts or sorry, specific insurance policies for specific individual cars because a householder lives in an area where it might hail or the car might be stolen or graffitied or whatever. Um, versus then, is there also a policy that covers autonomous driving you know, on a global scale where we're cut out of the picture? And that's unknown to us yet. But it's definitely a risk and a threat. Yeah, definitely. So how did you upskill yourself from a technical perspective in during your career as a founder and a venture capitalist so that you have a better understanding when talking to technical founders, such as that satellite IoT one you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so that's it's a good um good question. So I'm not technical, that's the first thing. And I think it's important to be realistic with yourself, what you are good at and not are not good at. Um, I'm definitely not technical in that regard. I, don't, I can't write a lot in a code or anything. So then it's like, okay, acknowledging that, like how can I confidently invest into businesses that are doing something extremely technical? Um, so I make sure that I can leverage other people that have skill sets that go far beyond mine. I think the skill set that I've developed is a good understanding of how to pull apart a business model and a customer proposition and understand whether that makes sense. And I like to use that as a bit of a sense check as well, even when I'm engaging with the most technical founders and the most technical opportunities. Because if I don't understand in my non-technical way what this company does, then, you know, in my experience, that they're probably not really doing anything that important or that interesting. Mm. I'm not super dumb. I'm not technical, but I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not stupid. So for example, this space tech company, I understand exactly what they're doing. I get the concept, I get the thesis. I understand the different parts of how that can come together. I have no idea how they're actually, you know, uh, I know a lot of their secret source is in the algorithms that allow for the transmission of this data in such a way that um, basically enables this whole thing to work, low bandwidth, low battery usage, et cetera. So with that aspect of it, and I go, okay, well, I need to get some confidence that this tech is actually legitimate. So that's when I rely on other people that are a lot smarter than me with regards to the tech, and I'll bring them in, and it's not just my opinion, but I trust some of these people. So I have a trusted group of people around me who I know are super, super technical. And I'll ask them to look at this and I'll say, you know, in this particular company, for example, they have a lot of patents. I have no idea how to interpret or read these patents and how to understand whether they're good or not good. You know, it's, it's just fluff, but people around me do. So I'll ask them to look at those patents and I trust their opinion as to whether this is unique or not unique. Like, is it actually groundbreaking or is it, you know, they're just saying it's groundbreaking and I'll take their word for it, but then I'll use my judgment to understand the business model and the customer problem. All right, cool. Are there any companies that you're following right now that you find really interesting or are excited about? Uh, well, obviously the two that we're currently engaged in the process of investing in, so the Space Tech one and the Data Governance one. Um, there's, so let me just think what else. Um, you know, there's a lot happening in the, uh, in the real estate space as well that I think is interesting. So there's companies, uh, like one called different that raised money from Airtree ventures recently that I think is super interesting, uh, changing the way people rent houses. Um, uh, but in terms of themes, I think there's a lot more in the computer vision space that I'm seeing emerge that I do find um incredibly uh just interesting so the like the arturo one for example what they're doing with satellite images is quite amazing but there's so much just recorded um data now whether it's recorded through photos or videos or whatever you know cctv cameras or drones satellites aircraft all these things that are capturing images of the world um you know i think we're only starting to see the beginning of the computer vision companies that are now building the models to interpret that and make sense of it. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening there. 
okay, cool. And so for the last question, so is the start, sorry, let me just, how do you start, startups demonstrate their traction to an investor? So it doesn't have to necessarily always be through revenue and building a big team and doing all of that. It just has to be pointing towards, like you just have to be convincing to show that, you know, you have not had much money, but you have done a lot with it. So if you're pre-launch, for example, um, like there's no, anyone can build a social media following, for example, on the back of zero dollars. Like, you know, you can post interesting content around the theme of your business, whatever that might be, and start to build an audience and it costs nothing. Um, like that's interesting. If you're pre-launch and pre-product and pre-everything else, but you've still built, you've managed to build a following, um, like that's traction and that's showing that you're resourceful and you've done something that has cost no money. Or maybe you are able to build a email list um, with potential customers that want to purchase your product or take part of a trial or whatever. We've done a whole bunch of customer interviews and you've got a whole bunch of interesting feedback. And so there's a whole lot of things that you can do that don't cost any money at all, all of which demonstrate traction um, and demonstrate that you're actually getting stuff done. So like that's what we just basically try and look at. And then once you start to launch your product and you start to um, make money, then obviously money becomes a metric and we're looking at, um, you know, customer signups. If it's a software product, we're looking at, um, you know, how many signups you've got. We're looking at retention of those customers. We're looking at how many free trials, the whole pipeline. So it's just doing a lot with a little. Okay, cool. So that's a wrap, everybody. A huge thank you to Mike for taking the time to share a bit about your career journey and your views on the insurance industry. I'm sure, like me, the audience has learned a lot of really interesting insights from you. And for those who want to connect with you or be updated with what your fund is doing, where can they find you on social media? Uh, sure. So LinkedIn is probably best. Uh, so just my name on LinkedIn. Um, we're also we're in the process of updating our website, uh, which our, cause our previous website, one of the challenges of corporate, unfortunately, is like sometimes basic things like that get lost in the quagmire of cybersecurity teams. And so, yeah, so we're making a new website separate from all of that, uh, which will go up this week as well. That'll have all our portfolio and then contact us form. And if you have a startup that you want to submit, you can do that there. Uh, so maybe I'll give that to you. I'll send that to you after the call um, tomorrow because it's going live this week. But otherwise, just on LinkedIn is best. And um, yeah, just hit me up on LinkedIn. That's the best way to get, get in touch. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mike. So we'll be sure to include this in our takeaways so all of you have access to this information. On behalf of TBV, I wanted to thank everyone in the audience for taking the time to spend your Tuesday night with us. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye.